Thank you for joining with me to study God's Word today. We have been in the midst of a six-week study dealing with messy relationships. We've been looking at six traits that God calls us to exhibit that can clean up or restore a messy relationship. Or if we live these traits out in our everyday life, they can even help prevent a relationship from getting messy in the first place. Just to quickly review, the first week we studied the word love. We learned that we should let love permeate or saturate every relationship that we have. In the second week, we studied the word encourage. We learned that encouragement strengthens relationships. Then in the third week, we studied the word forgive. We learned that forgiveness restores and also strengthens relationships. And then last week, we studied the word serve. We learned that we should seize the opportunity to serve, that we should serve one another through love, and that we should help carry one another's burdens. And remember, we said those burdens are those circumstances or difficulties or tragedies in life that cause the load to be too difficult for us to carry by ourselves. A good follow-up verse to last week's lesson is 1 Peter 4.10, which says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. So every person has been given at least one gift, and we should use that gift to help serve the needs of others and look for every opportunity to serve. Today, we are going to study the word yield. We're going to learn that we should humbly place the needs of others before our own. Think for a minute, when have you really wanted to be first in line for something? When have you really wanted to be first in line for something? You know, we might get amused when we see a news story about people who camp out overnight to be the first one to purchase the latest phone or tablet or gadget. On the other hand, we are saddened when we see reports of people pushing, shoving, or even punching to be the first in the store for a Black Friday sale after Thanksgiving. You know, we don't always want to be first, though. For example, the four-year-old will gladly let his sister go first when they are lining up at the doctor's office to get a shot. And the adventurer will step back and let someone else volunteer for a boring assignment. You know, those two examples share one thing, whether it is the first to be in line or last, it is selfishness. It is about what we want or what we want to avoid. A desire for something is not necessarily wrong, but when we push to get it at the expense of others, we have placed ourselves first and we have damaged relationships with others. In our lesson today, we're going to learn a better way. The Apostle Paul contended that we are called to be first in line for one thing, looking out for others. And when we do that, we get the benefit of a strong relationship. We're going to be reading from Philippians today. While you're turning there, here is the setting for our scripture reading. We'll be reading in Philippians chapter 2. Paul wrote the book of Philippians, wrote this letter to the church at Philippi when he was under house arrest in Rome, awaiting his first trial before the emperor. He wrote to thank the Philippians for the gift they had sent him through their messenger, Epaphroditus. And we're going to pick up in chapter 2 in his letter in verses 1 through 4. Paul wrote, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, Paul challenged the church at Philippi to strive for a new level of maturity in their relationships. He encouraged the believers to make my joy complete by thinking in the same way, by having the same love, by being united in spirit and intent in one purpose. In other words, he was saying, live in harmony with others. You know, unity among his people pleases God. In most churches, the members will not always agree on every single line item in the annual budget, but they can agree to stay together, to work together, to pray together, and to serve together. Let me say that again. We may not, in our church or in any person's church, 
all the members may not agree on every single decision that's made, but we can agree that we will stay together as God's church, that we will work together, that we will pray together, and that we will serve together. I want you to think about circumstances in life that tempt you to ignore the instructions in these verses. What circumstances in life tempt you to ignore the instruction in these verses? And probably whatever answers you come up with will have to do with what you want and not what is best for the needs of the whole. Let's look more closely at each of the verses that we read in verses 1 through 4. Let's look at verse 1. You know, one of the key themes of Paul's letter to the Philippians is his call for the church to remain united in Christ. In chapter 2, where we read, he urged them to live in humble unity. And that's, that's a unity that places the needs of others before your own needs. He pointed out in that first verse four realities of the Christian life as grounds for his appeal to unity, as a basis for his appeal to unity. Each of those begins with the word if. The intent was to communicate those to the believers in Philippi um, and help them to understand that they had those realities in common. Therefore, they should be united. Let's look at each one. The first one, the first unifying factor he said that they possessed was it, that it says, if you have any encouragement in Christ or any encouragement from being united with Christ. Paul assumed that the Philippian believers, as every believer would, answered to Christ. Christ is Lord. And so Christ calls us to unity. So the phrase in Christ or being united with Christ stressed that the Philippian believers' union with Christ was by their faith in him. A second reality that he mentioned was if they had any comfort from his love. You know, God's kind of love for us provides incentive for Christian unity. Then the third one, if they have any fellowship with the Spirit or any common sharing in the Spirit. As believers, we are all indwelt by, empowered by, and led by the Holy Spirit. So Christians are to work together for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit helps us to do that. And then finally, believers share in uh, tenderness and compassion. If you have any tenderness and compassion or your translation may say any affection and mercy. You know, believers are to be tender, they're to be compassionate, they're to be kind toward one another, especially in sharing sorrows and meeting the needs of others. So he shared those four common realities that every believer should should share. Then in verse 2, on the basis of those four realities, Paul appealed to the Philippian believers to make his joy complete by being unified. He said, by being like-minded or being unified together. So, and then he uses three additional phrases here to, to describe this oneness or this unity that he wanted for his friends in Philippi. First of all, he says, being like-minded. Then make my joy complete. First of all, how do they do that? By being like-minded or by thinking the same way as him. And this means that they were to have the same mindset, the same outlook, the same attitude. And so to do that, they would need to share the same values and purpose. Then, he says, they would be like-minded if they had the same love. And that love, again, this is the God's kind of love that Christ demonstrated for us and to us. And then they would have this kind of love if they were united in one spirit and purpose, or if they were united in spirit. And so that's a spirit of close-knit harmony. Um, it's a focus on one purpose. Then in verses 3 and 4, he said that unity requires selflessness on the believer's part. So notice what he says at the beginning of verse 3, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In other words, um, don't be self-centered. Believers need to be other-centered instead of self-centered. They shouldn't be in competition with another person or ego-driven. And that they must conduct themselves with humility. And the second part of verse 3 says, But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Now, let's make sure we have a clear understanding of what 
uh, humility is. First of all, it is not, humility is not weakness. It is not groveling at the foot of someone else. It's not a poor self-image of yourself. It's not a false denial of your talents or your skills or your accomplishments. Instead, humility is a healthy, balanced view of ourselves. It's a recognition of our strengths and our weaknesses. It's being comfortable enough with ourselves and strong enough to make a deliberate commitment to the welfare of others. It is a self-knowledge. It's a self-acceptance that keeps us from judging others, but instead looking for the good in others. And so that attitude or that virtue of humility enables us to consider others as more important than ourselves. We put others' interests first before ourselves. Not that we don't ignore ourselves, but we look to, like, kind of going back to last week's lesson, we look to serve others. We put others' interests first in humility. Think about when you have benefited from someone who looked out for your interests, someone who was always looking out for what was best for you. And then think about, do you look out for others, or do you mainly just look out for yourself? You know, most people have no trouble at all thinking about their own desires, what they want. You know, most of us don't need, don't need an alarm. We all have that remind feature or alarms on our phone. We don't need that to remind us to eat or to sleep or to play. We serve ourselves without thinking. However, we do need frequent promptings to keep our focus on the needs of others. So Paul offered that prompt here, encouraging his Philippi friends and us to make the needs of other people a major focus in our lives. So we are to humbly look out for the needs and the interests of others. In the next verses, we're going to see that Jesus is our example of humility and submission. Let's look at verse 5. So he said, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude should be the same. Other translations say, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So Paul challenged believers to observe Jesus and to learn what humility looks like by his example. We are to follow his example. Christ provided a perfect sacrifice for our sins he offers a perfect model to help us navigate our way through personal relationships. And it all comes down to attitude. We should adopt the same attitude or the same mindset as Jesus. So what was the attitude or mindset of Jesus? Well, let's look a little bit. We'll just make reference to it, but I'm going to be looking at verses 6, 7, and 8. We're not going to read those, but let's look at verses 6, 7, and 8. You know, the, the mindset that, that Christ showed was one of humility it was one of self-sacrifice. It was one of self-giving, of obedience, of service toward others. The same ideas that Paul had just encouraged the Philippians to demonstrate. So Christ is the supreme example of the proper attitude of humble selflessness, putting the needs of others first. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, um, he says that uh, he talks about Christ's deity. He says, from eternity... Christ existed as deity. He always was. He always was before anything was created. But he came to earth in the form of a human, but he was still fully God. And so to understand what God is like, we look to Jesus. Even though he is deity, he did not, verse 6 says, he did not think his equality with God the Father as something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he could have used all the rights of his deity while he was walking on this earth in the form of a man, but he chose not to do so. So what does that mean for us? So we should not be impressed with the worldly status of others or the position that others have, but we should instead have the same humble attitude as Christ as we serve others. Jesus taught his disciples that greatness consists of being a servant. You may have heard someone use the phrase servant leadership. Jesus certainly demonstrated that. He said the only area in which his followers were to seek to be first was in serving others. Then he offered the supreme example. In Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
So then in verse 7, Paul further explained that Jesus emptied himself. So Jesus chose to follow God's will. He chose to leave heaven, to lay aside the glory of God, and to take on the form of human, to take on humanity. All the aches, pains, the tiredness, the hunger, all the emotions that we go through, all the difficulties that we have, Jesus chose to do that. So the emptying of himself is closely related to him choosing to become a servant. He chose to do that, and he chose to serve. Like we just said in that verse from Mark chapter 10, he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and to give the, and to give the, the uh, maximum service for the needs of others by giving his life for our sins. So Jesus fully retained his deity, but he chose to limit his glory. And then in verse 8, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, that's him taking on the form of humanity, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Paul says that even though Christ was deity in human form, he, he humbled himself. The, you know, the Gospels emphasize that Christ consistently obeyed the Father. He told his disciples that his food was to do the will of him who sent him and to finish his work, talking about God the Father. And as he prayed before facing the cross, he prayed for the Father to take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And then Jesus was willingly obedient, even to the point of death, on the, the worst form of uh, death that mankind could come up with at that time, which was death on a cross. Jesus also taught humility in his parables. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus used the parable of a wedding banquet to challenge his followers to humbly select the worst seat in the house. Leave the favorite seat, the coveted seat, the seat closest to the guest of honor. Leave the coveted seat for someone else and consider yourself unworthy of such an honor. So when do you find it particularly difficult to have the same attitude or the same mindset as Jesus? It is difficult because we're human. Only God can help us to have that attitude or that mindset of Jesus. Then also think, how do we balance our responsibility to ourselves and to others? Jesus doesn't call us to ignore ourselves, to ignore our needs, but we are called to put others' needs first. So we have to pray through for God to reveal to us what he would have us do in meeting the needs of others. We also have to take care of ourselves at the same time. In the next verses, we're going to see that we must live humbly without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. Let's jump down to verse 13. Let's read verses 13 through 15. Paul said, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars. So when we read those verses, what captures your attention immediately when we read those verses? I'll bet it's that phrase that says, do everything without grumbling or arguing, or without complaining or arguing. So we might want to say, come on, Paul. Surely you don't expect me to stand in line for over an hour without complaining about that. You know, we, we truly can't accept, you know, our circumstances, a lot of times we think, we, I can't accept this circumstance without being upset at someone who caused that to happen. But Paul is saying, yes, we can. He is saying Jesus did it, and he expects us to follow his example. By the power of his spirit, we can live without grumbling. We can live without arguing. We can live without complaining or griping or raging against someone. It means that we must make the choice to remove all whining from our world. Not so easy to do. Let's look at what Paul says. In, in verse 13, there is encouragement here for how we do that before he says to do everything without complaining or arguing. Paul explained that the only way to truly live a submitted life in Christ, look at the verse again. He says, For it is God who works in you, 
to will and to act according to his good purpose. So God has a will for us. He has a purpose for us. He has works for us to do. And we can't do any of that without God's help. And he gives us the spirit to be our helper to do that. So as believers, we are to constantly work at living a submitted life to Christ, to Jesus. However, the Christian can live such a life only because God is at work in us. He promises to finish the work that he started in us. He's constantly working in our lives. So God supplies the necessary empowerment for us as Christians to be obedient to his will and to his purposes. You know, Paul did not teach that a Christian should be passive in how they live their life. He did not teach that Christians should just sit back and do nothing and let God do everything for you. Instead, he taught that God works in believers and believers actively work for what God asks them and gives them to do. So verse 13 is one of the most comforting verses that we can find in the New Testament. We do not strive in this world alone. We don't work in this world alone. God is working with us, in us, and through us. Then in verse 14, then he says, With that in mind, do everything without complaining or arguing, or without grumbling and arguing. You know, so we could use a lot of different words here. It means that we should not complain. It means that we should not gossip. It means that we should not murmur or talk amongst ourselves. And, and really, that's just complaining about what somebody else has done or what we think they're going to do. Any word that expresses displeasure with someone or something is considered grumbling or complaining. The word arguing can be translated evil thoughts or disputes or doubts. So one approach is to see grumbling as private complaints. We complain at home to ourselves, maybe to our spouse. And then arguing are public disputes where we are voicing our displeasure with someone or something. Now in verse 15, then he says, why should we do everything without complaining or arguing? Why should we do that? It says so that you may become blameless and pure. He wanted believers to be blameless blameless with regard to their lives toward one another as well as blameless in the world that they lived in. He commanded that their behavior be pure in light of their submission to one another and their submission to Christ. You know, the believers who embrace the example that Christ set for us will contrast themselves with the dark world, we, we, the dark world that we live in. We say all the time, we are called to live a life set apart Others should look at us as believers, as followers of Christ, and see that everything that we do, that we live differently, and we do things differently, and we think differently, and we talk differently, and we act differently than the world around us. Because Paul said, we, we should be blameless and pure, children of God, that we would shine like stars in the universe. Why, what is, why does he say that we should shine like stars? Because we let Christ who said he was the light of the world, shine through us as we live our life. When we start taking Paul's words seriously, our relationships will definitely be affected. When you take the focus off yourself and your circumstances, when you look for ways to humbly serve others, when you stop complaining and start loving others through service to them, when you take on the same attitude as Christ, when we do all those things, all of our relationships will be affected. And those same people will discover that we have stumbled upon a treasure that they desperately long to find. And that's the inner peace and the fixed joy that comes with following Christ every day. So what does it look like to practice these verses on a daily basis? You know, clearly as believers... Uh, we are not to grumble. We are not to complain. When we do that, it shows how worldly we still are. A complaining spirit leads to fighting and quarreling because complaints come from unfulfilled desires or not getting what we want, and that can lead to envy or strife or disagreements with others. So it's not wrong to complain to God about something, but we, we, it is wrong to complain about God. If we have to complain then let it be us complaining to him about our own sinfulness, our own faults, so that 
he will forgive and cleanse us and put within us a new heart, one that rejoices rather than complains. What strategies have helped you to fight the urge to grumble or complain or argue? Or maybe you need some strategies to help you not to grumble or complain or argue. If you realize that God is speaking to you about that, ask him, how do I do this, God? The next time I wanna, I'm tempted to complain or argue or grumble about something, help me to stop. Help remind me of these verses because you call me not to do that. So how do we live this out? Well, we can take small steps we can do something like park in the, in the worst space uh, in the church parking lot the next Sunday that you attend. Next Sunday, May 31st, will be the first Sunday that we will open back up for uh, in-person worship gathering. So you could do that next Sunday. You could park in the worst spot and allow others to have spots that are closer to the door. If it's raining, you get extra credit. Or you could tell someone how you appreciate his or her gifts or skills in a particular area. Those are small steps that we can do. What about medium steps? Share a story of a major failure from your past. Share that with someone who might need to hear that. Confess your need for the gospel. Tell someone how important it is to you. Volunteer in a homeless ministry or and, and treat those people as you would treat a, a governor or a king. Our church gives opportunities to do that, especially around Thanksgiving and Christmas time. And then there are large steps that we can take. We can offer a sincere apology to someone that we have hurt. We can share our desire to be forgiven. And we could meet someone's need who has a, uh, a monetary need, and we could do that anonymously. You know, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, let today be the day. He wants you to have that inner peace. He wants you to have that fixed joy but that only comes when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. Nothing can separate you from His love. There isn't anything that you have to do to make Him love you anymore. He already loves you so much that He was willing to send Jesus Christ to die for your sins. His one and only Son. All you have to do is confess that you are a sinner, that you need the only Savior who can save you from your sins. And when you do that, you are promised to spend eternity with him. Don't wait another minute. Claim Jesus as your Savior and your Lord today. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful that we have Jesus as our example to follow, that Jesus came and lived a life of service to others, that he was humble, that he put the needs of others before himself. Lord, help us to do the same, to have his attitude, to have his mindset, to see where we can meet a need and to put those needs of a focal point for us, that we would humbly serve one another. Help us not to complain when we don't get our way, when we don't get what we want, but instead, Lord, help us to live blameless and pure. And we're thankful, God, that you help us to do that, and we don't have to do it on our own. We're thankful, God, that you love us. It's your name we pray. Amen.